is an inherent affinity between the condition of migrancy and the condition of knowing. And the moment knowing stops and settles in a place, it stops being knowing. Migrants are always on the move and so is knowledge. Migrants carry knowledges with them. Things travel, people travel, ideas travel. I'm a child of four different countries, you know, and here we are in Cambridge, but I'm simultaneously elsewhere. I'm in exile, <laughs> perpetually, uh, in, and in transition. The layers of identity, the layers of actually being many, um, it seems to me that it's almost like the reason why we woke up the next morning. If we are one thing and we are all the same, we don't woke up in the next morning, we don't say hello to each other because we know it all. Every encounter with the other holds a mirror towards yourself. So this increasingly um, shifting world that we live in is also widening our horizon in so many ways. And the arrival of people in our countries widens also our potential. I was born in Guinea. You know how many countries have been before arriving here? How many people have seen? How many people have experienced? How many people have informed you? How many people have seen? Tutti i tipi di persone, ma alla fine tutto questo ti dico ognuno con la sua storia. Non sei andato per cercare questo, invece te l'ho portato. We wanted to have the voices of those we were talking about, not just talking about them at a distance, but migrant voices represented firsthand. I still remember, in fact, my very first encounter with the immigration officer. These are things that invite us at least, or they've invited me to, to, to write, uh, to write without seeking sympathy or empathy. I don't like this quick adjective of being called a Syrian artist or a male artist or um, a religious artist or a political artist. I found them quick, quick fix, quick pigeonholes just to put some, somebody in that category. But we are much more than that. Writing precedes my legal status. It has nothing to do with my legal status. Not all refugees can write. And not all refugees are good human beings. We have to remember that. It's not about stating that all these people are homogenous. That is the point of the game. That in your life, you make plans This event really comes out of um, a need, an urge that I was feeling increasingly, partly because of the world we live in, partly because of where I am in my own life, partly because uh, of the way in which home and homelessness have been very emotive topics for me lately. I do not know where home is, but I also relate to to mainly the people within this space, which is the camp that has marked us all. So is there a specific place that I can call home? What is home? You know, we, some of us are unwilling migrants, some of us are accidental immigrants, some of us, you know, meant to come and stay, some of us didn't. Uh, but we are where we are and we need to make sense of our own position in the world and that is tied up with, our, with human relationships with other human beings and uh, relationships between places. The idea of exile, of, of being in two places, which is what exile is, being in one country but remembering somewhere else is au fond, uh, the essential beginning of all storytelling. There are art forms which emerge in response to the phenomenon of migration. And then there are art forms that migrant artists themselves find as vessels or vehicles to speak. So I wanted to give voice to people who have 
traveled, whether through choice or choicelessness, and to talk about how art is helping them process that, um, that those transitions. If you create um, um, a space, like I've created with the Library of Exile, you are more aware of the necessity for translation, for moving across borders, for how much we owe this endless, iterative movement from one language into another, from one country to another. You know, you scan these shelves and you realize you are surrounded by two millennia of voices of people who have created us as Europeans, you know, from every country in the world. For five years I've had this dream of creating a library of the literature of exile. Exile meaning anyone who's been forced to cross a border, forced to move with their language. 3,000 books from Ovid all the way through Dante up to the 20th, 20th and 21st 20th centuries. Um, a whole richness of the library of people who are refugees or exiles. She did to me what a friend would normally do for a friend or a lover for another lover. She held my hand very tightly. When I looked at her, my fingers were above the scanner. My flesh was scanned and so was the air around us. Outside the building, a history of all the lost, uh, destroyed libraries of the world, from Alexandria uh, all the way through um, all the destroyed rabbinical and madrasa libraries, the bombed libraries, the book burnings, the counter-reformation, all the way through to Sarajevo to the destroyed libraries of the 21st century. I thought of looking her in the eye again, pretending that we were in love. And in that room, where asylum seekers and suspects gather, it was our opportunity to embrace one another while the machine was doing its job. But you come in and there's this huge, vibrant, vigorous literature. You're surrounded by the literature of exile. You pick up any book in any language, you write your name in it, and it becomes even richer. So it's celebrating the literature of exile. I gave my fingerprints and left. Every time I think of that moment, I feel the need to go back to that terminal and ask her what it meant to touch a stranger. This is actually one boat made out of bicycle mud guards. And inside there is resin and there is burnt matches and for me each element of this has stories to tell so the story of the mud guard this object in the bicycle to guard you from the mud but in my case these boats are not guarding my Sir Syrian fellows from the sea and the resin inside is almost like one could interpret it as water but I this is far too simplistic for me it's actually it is a bond because in the time of tragedies people bond together a man from Sudan who managed to get out of the camp on the back of a lorry and he is reflecting about um, passports, about what, what it means to have a passport. Any passport is like a toilet paper. Your identity, it becomes so simplified, tiny, small piece of paper that tells so much about you, but tells nothing about you. It's the tragedy, it tells absolutely nothing about you. And this is what he says. I went back to Calais at the end of March this year. It's crazy what a passport can do. With that little book in my hand, I made the crossing in 20 minutes, a journey which once took me 10 months. It seemed to me that these little books control our lives, 
more than humanity, more than kindness, more than right or wrong. Without them, we are like pawns in a game of chess. Borders are very strange. Borders are these hugely difficult liminal spaces. They're, they're places of transition. Uh, and you can, you can have creative borders and you can have borders of control, which are places of violence. La sofferenza che ho dovuto affrontare di più è stato il viaggio perché il viaggio mi ha distrutto. Il viaggio mh, tra Libia e Italia è stato con la barca no? e queste reti di immigrazione perché è una cosa che non puoi immaginare. Ma queste persone carrying trauma con them. So il trauma del burnt match è molto importante. And we carry our traumas with us, we deal with it. Sometimes we hide it, sometimes we reveal it. And my Syrian fellows are actually dealing with it in many ways. This is a journey that in fact lacks a destination. People do not know where they are going to end up living. It's not their choice to reach a place. It's their choice to reach a place where they can at least continue living continue living in a peaceful manner. And this is a very basic human right. The Mediterranean is becoming a liquid grave. And uh, the history of uh, a sea that has been a symbol of sharing uh, is quickly shifting into something uh, graver and darker. And the sea is the wall sometimes. The sea creates the wall and kind of limits people's freedom of movement, I suppose. So, but also the sea is, the, the freedom of movement and power go together very strongly. So the sense that the sea limits people and that migrants are limited by lack of money and lack of power. I think the times are very bleak and governments everywhere are restricting immigration. But perhaps that's exactly why we need to be thinking about it, aware of it. But also, we are sitting in a very comfortable position, in a conference, talking about poetry, workshops. Out there, there is the hard world where people are trying to survive. But the one thing needs the other. Mediterranean is, I think, the cradle of civilization. And we should continue being a cradle of civilization and teach people welcome. We are great with hospitality. And we should continue being hospitable. I mean, my country is like a mille feuille. It's one people after another after another. And we're living together back in peace. Io ci sono stati dei momenti molto particolari, molto, molto difficili che io ho dovuto superare, no? Ma il problema è è sempre io credo in futuro. I mean, it's absolutely the case that Dean is an exceptional person with exceptional gifts of courage and spirit and imagination. But it's also the case that a lot of the people who have come are like him. Credo di più le cose andranno meglio. Io, quando ho le difficoltà, penso al positivo. Dico che le cose non rimarranno così. Situations they seem to come in cycles and that situations can be similar. Something that happened three or four hundred years ago is still, it's a still a human story. It's still about migrating and moving. It's about human happiness and human suffering. The circumstances might be different, but the fundamentals of migrating are the same. The idea of actually seeing others and being able to to create both if you like to create a place where you could separate yourself from the other but equally finding a common ground with the others because we all have something very special that is we like to share with others dialogue is um, you know, a crucial word because you know in a way that's what we are trying to do um, we live in a divided world and in a very divisive world. You know, we don't all agree with each other. We can't. 
you know, our subject positions are different, our economic positions are different. The only way forward, people talk about bridges, people talk about, you know, connections. How can we build that through dialogue? Migration is how you define it. We have to build into our account more and more is the danger and necessity of uncertainty. Yesterday we had two people who sang to us. I think that's unusual in an academic conference. I think it was very good. We had the Punjabi song that had circulated unpublished for so many years and somebody singing that to us to represent the experience of Punjabis in this country in the UK. We had the wonderful contribution from Muhammad from Good Chance Theatre um, sharing his Sudanese musical skills. Those moments were for me, the ones I'll remember. Music is one of the ways in which we connect with our roots, one of the ways in which we connect with one another in ways we can often find it very hard to put into theories. And that's why music is, is so important. It connects us, as I say, in ways we don't completely understand with one another, but for that very reason it builds bridges to the experience of others. Are breaking that comfort zone but breaking it in a in an energetic energized way sometimes even fun having fun with the fact that yes we have these plural realities you know Wafa yesterday she sang and danced that story that came out of collaborative you know, experience and that was a wonderfully uh, I don't know liberating joyful thing for me uh, and joy can be as disruptive of comfort as pain and I think we've addressed both trying to find a story about abolishing borders between nations. What I've tried to do in the way I've invited artists is to preserve and respect and honor and address the plurality and the multiplicity of aesthetic experiences of migrancy. I wanted it not to be a conventional conference. Uh, I called it an anti-conference because we do too much talking amongst ourselves in a language only we speak. So I wanted to break the walls down between activists, artists and scholars and academics and I think we have done that. Um, I feel happy, excited. What I feel is that a field of energy is emerging and that's the best thing these conversations can do. In brief, I think what we've managed in the last three days is to put the present set of questions about migration that are occupying so much attention, so much anxiety in Europe against a broader context, both historical and ethical. To make that connection between some of the academic historical issues about the migrant experience and how it is now, I think we need to do a lot more of that connection. That's where knowledge and migrancy come together. Apart from the fact that as people move and things move and ideas move, with those movements, knowledges shift and transform, uh, become other knowledges. Sometimes they 
become unknowledge or disknowledge of a kind. So yes, this is a title that was meant to be pregnant, not to close down the subject, but to open it up. I think there was a great deal of movement, a great deal of real exchange. Um, we were challenged, I think quite rightly, about some of the things we took for granted. We were obliged to, in a good way, obliged to broaden our horizons. I'm so grateful to everybody who came on board with different views from different domains, different expertise, and they just um, threw themselves into the event. And I think it's a testament to the urgency and the, um, the resonance of the theme. We did justice to the two ways you could read the title, Migrant Knowledge, what do migrants know but also what is it about knowledge that is moving and migratory.